Okay, let's try this this morning. So yesterday we left off with the signal format getting ready to go into the analog to digital scenario. Now you guys have already done the analog to digital scenario back in block two with the PRC 150 and you had a touch upon it. Well, this is going to explain more of what you were doing in that little box. When we look at the Nyquist theorem, this is analog to digital conversion. There are many different platforms out there. Has anybody ever heard of Audacity? No? Yes, but only because I watched your video from May. Oh, <laughs> okay. Audacity is a free software program, and when you save your audio file, you have the selection for either WAV files or MP3 files. Now, the MP3 files is a more detailed version of what you can save it as because it will show you everything from 8 kHz all the way up to 320 kHz for a sampling rate. So this fits into the Nyquist theorem that we're getting ready to talk about. What Dr. Nyquist, yeah, real guy, you can see him on the internet, he came up and developed this sampling rate. And what he said, if we go two times the highest audio frequency, that will be our sample rate. And since we're only dealing with voice, he said, you know what? Most of our voice that we talk, or, or the masses is what he was referring to, goes anywhere between 300 hertz all the way up to 3K hertz. So he said, you know what, there are some people out there that can get lower than the 300 hertz because of the deep vibrato bass voice or the more soprano voices up there. So he said, you know what, we're going to make this all the way up to 4K. That'll be the highest voice, voice frequency. Now, in relationship to the audacity, when you have 320K, for a sampling rate. That's because they're dealing with everything from way down low around that 5 hertz all the way up to 20 K hertz. So they need to sample it a little bit more. So with voice, all we're trying to do is communicate. So that's what his focus was on when he developed this theorem in being able to convert our analog voice, voice over to digital information. And this is the precursor to PCM. So, Nyquist theorem, two times the highest audio will equal the sample rate in what you've got to do to give you an intelligible voice signal on the distant end. Let's see how he does that when we go from analog to digital. So, with these three steps, sample, quantize, and encoding, is how he is able to get this from an analog to a digital scenario. When we look at step one, this says receives the analog signal from the user. Okay, we're the user, we click on our handset, we talk into the microphone, and we're gonna sample that 8,000 times a second. Now let me grab my arrow here, and it says something about these Pulse amplitude modulated pulses. That's PAM. PAM is in the spray. You know the spray that she's spraying the skillet, not Peter Pan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, what this does is remember we talked about sampling. When we sample these, these are all in sequence, and they're mm -hmm. equally spaced. We are sampling this audio signal eight thousand times a second. Now, when you come right down to it, the processor speed has everything to do, too, with the how it is able to produce and uh, demodulate, so to speak. You know, produce it and modulate, and then when it comes back in, you got to demodulate it and uh, decrypt it from the digital to the analog. Step two is when we take those pulses and apply a decimal value to it. 
and we use something called a quantization table. And there's two different types. We have an analog and a digital, or excuse me, a uh, uniform and a non-uniform quantization table when we take those pulses and apply it and make a decimal level. Now, what I did here is use a graph paper to give you an idea that we have 127 different spaces to the vertical and a negative 127 spaces to the you know, negative side, so positive and negative. This is called uniform quantizing. Why? Because they're equally spaced both horizontally and vertically. Hence the graph paper. Now, the positive 127 is a certain voltage level and a negative 127 is also a certain voltage level. It didn't state that when I was doing my research on there, so it just gives you an idea how things can be applied in keeping the distances so the, the analog signal doesn't peak out and hit the top or the bottom of that uniform quantization table. Now, when we look at the quantization table, it's 127 steps. Now, how did we get 127 steps out of it when we are in relationship to the digital format? Well, let's go back up here and go back to the numbers that we looked at. Remember the 8-bit word? You have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, uh, wait a minute, 128, hmm, if 128 you were to add 1 through 64, you will get 127. Start to see where this is starting to play out. So when we come back to the quantization table, you can see the steps. 127 to the positive, 127 to the negative. And we're going to apply that analog signal where those pulses are on this quantization table. When we look at it, we have uniform quantizing. And again, each one of these are spaced equally as far as the, the vertical scenario goes. Still the same horizontally. The problem that we have is if a pulse falls between the decimal lines, we're going to get a quantization error. Now, what's that going to sound like to you? Well, if you get enough of them, it's going to sound like you're a little off, like a robot voice or something to that extent. That would be one way of explaining it. Sometimes they call it distortion. Uh, but in our, our case, since this is in the second step, they call it quantization errors. Now, this, again, is on the quantization table, non-uniform table, excuse me, uniform table. In order to correct for the quantization errors, we go to something called a non-uniform quantizing table. Now, you can still see from the 0 to the positive 127, it's the same space. However, we've taken the decimal lines and squeezed them together where most of the people would talk. Again, the people that have the higher voices, higher pitched voices, and the people who have lower pitched voices, yeah, they're going to be a little bit difficult to understand on the opposite end because of the quantization errors, but most of the people you'll be able to hear clearly. And that's because of where the audio, most of your audio that people speak in a regular voice will fall within those lines. Now, it doesn't correct for all quantization errors because there's always that little backdrop of what happens if it falls right in the middle of one of these lines. Well, there's, you know, you still got to round up or down just like with anything else. Well, what is it? Five and above? is uh, you got to round up and four and below, you round down. So with these quantization errors, they, they through the non-uniform table, they correct for most of those quantization errors. So when we get to the third step, remember we talked seven bits versus eight bits. Well, 
here's where the eighth bit comes into play. You know that the table shows a positive and a negative. Well, that eighth bit is going to be reserved or whether or not it's a positive or negative. So those are the three steps. Let's take a look at how they encode them. When you take a look at this, looking at this whole representation of an audio waveform, you will find out that we will have like one or two that will fall in between it and just nature of the beast, so to speak. You will have, and I'm just going to pull one out of my hat. Let's do the five. So we come here at the five. And again, going with right to left, we have a one in the one slot. We have a zero data in the two slot. In the four slot, we have another one. So one, which is four, and the one gives us five. But we got to come all the way over to the eighth bit to find out if it's a positive or a negative. In our case, all positive numbers are zeros. All negative numbers are ones. So you can see that what that 8 bit is doing for us. All logics of ones and zeros being sent out. Now, with the PRIC150, it uses something called CVSD, continuous slope uh man, CV continuous variable slope, and I can't remember what the D was standing for, but it is a form of PCM. It uses these eight bits to form it and then send it out. That's how the PRIC150 works. So we get out of the analog to digital. Now we're going to say, well, okay, let's go back to multiplexers for just a minute and think about what we call frame periods. Now the definition states the time it takes for one frame to occur. What does that mean? Well, you remember that we went one through however how many channels that we had. Well, now we're going to find out how much time it took to go from channel one, in our case a standard uh, TDM, time division multiplexer, 24 channels. So it took from doing frame one all the way to frame 24, we're going to find out how much time it took to do that. And the way we find this out is, in order to get our frame period, we're going to take our sample rate and do the reciprocal of it. So it's eight, 1 over 8,000 samples per second. In our case, when you divide those out, you get 0 0.000125 seconds or 25 microseconds. So it took the sample all 24 channels 125 microseconds so that's what a frame period is it's pretty big when you come right down to it so the multiplexer went from 1 through 24 and that's what it used is it possible to get more samples sure is sure is but in our case we only want 8,000 because if we take a look at the measurement for it, we're looking at most sample rates for a voice channel, which is 64K. And there's a long process in when we talk about the TDM itself and the hierarchy. We'll get to that. I think it's in the next objective, if I'm not mistaken. Next up, we have pulse modulated sample period. Now, this is the time it takes when we've already sampled all 24 channels and we want to know, let's just say pick a channel. Well, I want to know how long it took to get channel 5's uh, sample. Okay, so the definition is the time it takes to sample one channel, one channel, any one of those 1 through 24 channels in a frame. So the frame took us 125 microseconds. Now I want to find out what the channel 5 is going to do for us how long it took to do that one the whole thing with the pulse modulated sample period is it's based on the number of 
channels that's in that multiplexer. Remember, I told you about the FCC 100 having 24, uh, excuse me, 16 channels. Well, how many channels are on the NSM? Eighteen. Uh, no, we said twelve. Twelve. Okay, we haven't got to the NSM, but I was hoping the round if you were listening yesterday. So that's twelve. So everything is dependent on the number of channels you have in that multiplexer. Okay. So in our case, let's just take a standard TDM multiplexer, and we're going to take the frame period which we got which was 125 microsecond, and we're going to divide it with all those channels. In our case, the standard one is a 24 channel uh, time division multiplexer. So we divide 24 into 125 microseconds, and we come up with 0 0.00000528 seconds, or 5.28 microseconds. So it took, let's just say channel 5, like I was telling you about. Channel 5 took 5.28 microseconds to sample. Wow, that's pretty quick, isn't it? Now, this is not the fastest one. This is just your standard one with IEEE. Do, do you guys know who IEEE is? International uh, is that a Protocol. Yeah, well, there is, it's an organization. He's getting it. Uh, International uh, Electronic Electrical Electronics ugh, Engineering, I guess. But it's a whole bunch of scientists getting together, and they formulate standards to where the companies can adhere to to have interoperability. That's the reason why an Apple can work with a uh, PC, uh, an Apple phone can work with an Android and vice versa and everything else like that. That the whole purpose behind that is to formulate these theoretical and, uh, you know, when we do equations and that, they develop all these theories and then they improve these theories and then when they do the research, they develop electronics to where there's that standard and this is adhering to this particular theory. So, it's nature of the beast. This is to keep everybody on the same path so we don't deviate and one uh, company dominates another. For example, Apple used to dominate the computer industry until the PC came out. Now you have Apple and the PC. There for a while, they wouldn't work with each other, would they? In fact... It, back in the day, my day, when you bought, let's just say, a Dell computer, you could only work with a Dell printer. You couldn't go out and buy a Apple printer to work with it. Wouldn't work. So nowadays, that's the reason why you can just buy a printer and it will work with just about anything. So that's the whole idea behind frame period and pulse modulated sample period questions. I know it's pretty overwhelming with that. We'll go through this later on. Uh, if you want SI, we can do that too. And who's your instructor, Sergeant Davis for labs, right? Yes, sir. It's Sergeant Davis. Okay. And, and he's pretty good about if you ask him a question, he will try to relate it to you. So again, I'm here for you. Any questions on that one? Oh, sure. All right, so let's try to go to one Charlie, identify basic facts about network bandwidth management equipment. How many can you miss on a test? Twelve. Uh, what's the time period? All right. Okay, how many questions? Forty. Okay, so when we look at the AFSC application, bottom line is you're programming in the bandwidth. When you are doing the NSM 50, you're programming in the bandwidth, you know, and then you're implementing it with the HST 3000 and doing the loopback. Hmm, didn't know that, did you? Yes, you were doing it on one of those tabs in, you know, like 256, 128, you know, things like that. 
bring back memories? Sure it does. So yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> we look at bandwidth allocations, network infrastructure, transmission media, carrier system concepts, and hierarchy. Before we go anywhere, Aaron Brown, can you tell me what the three uh, self-clocking signal formats are? Can you repeat the question again, sir? Sure can. What are the three self-clocking formats that we talked about yesterday? Phone a friend? Yes, sir. I'm trying to think. Okay. eBay? Any idea, eBay? Um... Mm, I was, uh, just, like, except for the, what do you call? Mm, that's a bipolar idea. Yeah. You can rule out all the non-return to zeros. That's because true. You said that N means it's not self-locking, or you can think of it like that. Okay, I heard somebody say something. I don't know who it was, but could you repeat, please? I was just trying to zero in. It, I thought bipolar was one of the options. But. You're getting close. RZ bipolar with zero suppression is the third one. Okay, that's one of them. What's the other two? CDI. Correct. RZ polar. Yes. Okay, Pingle. Out of... All those signal formats, what makes CDI so much more different? Um, ooh. Ooh, I got that one. There's your friend if you want to phone one. I'll pick you up on that. Self-clocking? Well, that's true, but what makes it so much more different than all the other signal formats? Um, it uses transitions. Bingo. Transitions. Instead of relying on the zero for a logic of one or a zero, and the five as a logic one or zero, it transitions between those. Remember, zero has two transitions. Uh, ones have one transitions. Well, that's what makes it so much more different. All right. So let's go on and continue to bandwidth allocations, network infrastructure, transmission media, carrier system concepts, and hierarchy. Remember I was talking about that earlier? There are four, count them, four different bandwidth allocations. you got conventional, demand assigned, dynamic, time of day. Let's look at each one of them. Conventional, just... Same fixed amount for each user. It's 64K for each user. The dedicated line. The problem is, if you're not using it, it's wasted bandwidth. Here's a picture. Pictures are always worth a thousand words. Kind of explains it a little bit. You can see channels one through four. When you add all those 64Ks, and by the way, 64K is an indication that it is a voice channel. So you have a total input of 256K when you combine all those voice channels 1 through 4 with a total bandwidth of 256. You can see that our two of them are being used, two of them are not. This is basically what looks like a synchronous PDM. Hmm, yeah, could be. We look at demand assigned, it's the exact amount for each user. No input is dedicated. Bandwidth is available when users disconnect, i.e. the internet. Hmm. When you look at this, this is basically what your internet provider, provider is doing. For example, with my provider, AT&T, there's two modes that i know of one is the maximum for wired which is what i have which is uh 25 meg and 
There's another one. I think it's around 18 meg. Those are the two tiers that you can purchase, which means that at any time that I'm online, I should be able to get all 25 meg. Well, that's true during the day because everybody's on doing what I'm doing, doing the uh, teleworking and streaming and so forth and so on. Well, later on at night when everybody gets offline, then that 25 meg might be more if I'm playing like World of Tanks and my son's trying to suck up all the bandwidth. <laughs> but also, there's more to it. I have like cameras. Even though it's on the intranet, it still goes through everything. I have uh, probably four computers, maybe five computers going at one time. I have my AFNET computer over here who is constantly pinging the VPN, getting updates. So that's two computers right now that's sucking up bandwidth. I have a heating and air conditioning unit that sends information back and forth to the provider letting it know and logging all the information so it can improve my heating and air conditioning you know for you know when i'm leaving the house or whatever whenever that happens uh you know things like that so there's things around the house that will suck up your bandwidth that you don't realize and i Bet over there in the dorms, there's a lot of people that have their phones, cell phones toggled to go to Wi Fi the moment that they see a hotspot. And if they have any type of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, hotspot available, availability in the dorm there most of those phones are going to seek that out instead of going and using their data. It's just a, a, a scenario that you might, guys over there in the dorms might be experienced. But, like I said before, you can see from this picture, you got different tiers here that people need. That's what they pay for. But there's always that outside chance. For example, you got 64K, 9.6K, 56K, totaling up that you have when you subtract that from the 256k available you got 126.4 left can you get more sure can remember you're paying for let's just say that mine is 25 gig of data if i get near that data then they're probably going to restrict me back down to my you know whatever i paid for and they call that throttling so you can see how this demand assign can be applied to the internet. Even though there might be that bandwidth available, there's always that little catchphrase of, you know, you paid for X amount of data, you've exceeded that data, so we're going to throttle you back down to where you should be to begin with. So if you went over, in my case, over 25 meg during the, the daytime, let's say I was using 30 or 40 because you know, Discord, my net, my computer, uh, son's computer, my, my wife's computer, all coming on at the same time. Yeah, it can get a little crazy in sucking up some bandwidth. So anytime that I would exceed the 25 meg and I was past my data cap, then yeah, they're probably going to throttle me back to the 25 from that, whatever I was using at that time. So that's what demand assign means. When we look at dynamic, this one it's kind of like what I call a trunking system. Now, when, back when we had block five, we would give you that scenario of LMRs when they were using the trunking system. Trunking system is nothing more than, hey, I got 10 frequencies for 10,000 people to use. Are you going to use all 10 frequencies at the same time? Probably not, but it can happen during the peak hours, so to speak. But where I came from at Hill Air Force Base, that was going to be crazy when they had 10,000 radios, but I would probably say about seven to 8,000 was on the actual base. The rest of them were out in the uh, Utah test and training range. So therefore, they could, you know, 
Might have to add some more frequencies to keep from being busy all the time, but this is how dynamic works. They max it out in hopes that it won't stay busy all the time and everybody won't key up at the same time. This is an example of it. You can see that we have mass amount of input, 384K, but we only have 256 output on it. What does that mean? Well, if everybody has is on using the 256K, you come on and you want to use yours, you're going to have to wait until somebody unkeys so you can utilize that bandwidth. So you're probably going to get a busy signal on that. Time of day restriction. I like to equate this to a movie. Has anybody ever seen Lone Survivor? Yes, sir. That had Mark and Mark in it. Mm hmm. And at one point, they were trying to get back to the base with their SATCOM, and they couldn't. Of course, I could explain why, but they had specific times that they would be able to call back to the base. That was their time set aside. They had priority to do that. I think the first time they were able to communicate, the rest of the times they weren't. They actually had to do a sat foam in order to say help. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that if you have the time slotted, please utilize it. Because we buy time on those satellites for that purpose. Because the military not only uses their own satellites, but we also buy uh, time off of commercial satellites. And that's what time of day restriction is. So let's change gears and go to network infrastructure. Network involves two or more user interchanging voice data or message traffic. What that means is you've got a network now doing servers and everything else exchanging that data from point A to point B. And like I showed you yesterday on that cable submarine map, uh, it gets quite extensive. Now that's just the underwater. Can you imagine how the internet is in, you know, just in stateside? It's massive. So that's what they're saying, a network. So we look at the EIA standards, chronic industry standards, just like the IEEE. They also develop these items. So we do have a standard to follow. We got the EIA 232 Charlie, the EIA 530, and if you were paying attention to the NSM, you would actually see that 530 appear on the back next to the NRZ ports. And I think we have one at 613 on the HISI port. We'll get to that later on in the uh, lesson. The 232 Charlie. For those of you that didn't grow up with dial-up, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Those of you that do know what you're, you know, utilizing the dial-up, remember the, the do -do 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 when you, you know, press connect and yes, sir. it would have had that beating and then a and it would click and go silent. There you go. That is the EIA 232 Charlie. And then your mom yells at you because she can't make a phone call. <laughs> or worse, you're in the middle of eBay getting ready to uh, snipe, I guess they called it back then. Uh, a, you know, snipe being, a, I'm waiting the last possible second to submit my your bid. Your bid and... You know, sometimes <laughs> it would work, that. sometimes it wouldn't. <laughs> but That's such a dirty way to do business, but it did work. Yeah, it did work. But the problem is, is if you're right as that, you know, when you we saw the 10 second mark, you press, you know, enter. Mm -hmm. And the problem was, is if someone called you, you're toast. <laughs> yeah, you don't get your. You don't get the bid in because it just dis it disconnected you. I wasn't old enough to be buying, but I was watching my dad do it and him cussing at the screen. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, those are the days. Those are the days. But that's what the 232 Charlie did for us. It wasn't good, but it did it well enough to where we could connect to the Internet. So 
that is without the use of a modem. You would connect to a number and get all that different sounds, and then you could go wherever you needed to go. And then, of course, how it connected was a different story. So we look at transmission lines. We have two different types. One's balanced, the other's unbalanced. So let's look at balance first. They call it a differential transmission because it carries uh, the data on two wires. However, the differential part is because one of them is 180 degrees out of phase from the other one. Now, the explanation is, is when you see the first line driver there and it sends those two data signals down the line to the other line driver and the other one's 180 degrees out of phase, back in the day, those twisted pair created some noise as you go further down the line because of resistance and capacitive capacitance and inductance and so forth and so on so it creates its own noise not to mention if you had a high voltage line really close to it so when it got to the distant end it had a lot of noise but what they figured out is if you had one that was reversed and you flip flopped them what would happen is it would cancel all the noise this is the precursor to head or a, he a noise canceling headphones. What it does is it takes all that outside inner, uh, information, runs an inside information, you know, if it can hear it, and then it will flip it and cancel it out. So all you hear is your headphones. I don't have any. And my son does, and it's hilarious when my wife is trying to call him for dinner. Because he gets louder and louder and louder until he goes, ah! <laughs> it's always funny around dinner time. We had some on the flight line that you could whisper to each other, even if there was a jet engine going on 50 feet away from you. You could, it would drown that out, but it would pick up the whisper. Oh, wow. Those they are... were good. They were like several, I don't know, they were at least $1,000 a set. It was really nice. Well, you kind of have to have them if you were dealing with jets. Or you just use double EP and shout at each other and use hand signals. No, that's true, too. Okay, so let's look at unbalanced lines. Now, the first ones, let me go back to balance. Those were on a twisted pair. This one is on a coax cable. Now, with a coax cable, you're dealing with the center pin or the center conductor as the transmission back and forth with your signals. The outside, which is a shield, that's grounded. Now you can see where it says return signal and seeing the ground. That's because of all the noise that may be happening on the exterior of that uh, conductor. And the idea is you want to ground it. And that is preventing noise from getting on the center pin. Now, back when I was going through the Z series and the double watt series TO, they had one complete section on communications ground. There is a difference between electrical ground and communications ground. You have to keep the two separate. In today's electrical, kid you not, they always connect the cable or your phone to the electrical ground. That's a problem. It meets the minimum requirements of grounding. But what they don't know is if you got a bad electrical where you're starting to see problems on your ground, noise and that, it also comes back on your communications. We're talking your internet. We're talking if you're watching cable. You know, any of those, you're going to have problems. So I... After Hurricane Katrina, I got mine separate. A minimum of 10 feet is what they recommend. Mine is more like 15 to 20, last time I can think. But my cable and my phone that come in through the internet is all on a separate ground. I have never had a problem with noise. Stuff happens. The things that you learn in here can be applied in the residential and commercial areas so take this information you can apply it out there in the field 
Now, let me go one step further. You guys do know that we have an RF Transmissions Facebook page? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you're on there, there's a lot of jobs that come down and a lot of uh, important people from the military side that are sending out information, too, about our electronics career field. So it just goes to show you, you, know, you might be able to get one up and be able to find what's going on. For example, I think there is a ham radio fest up in Canada that we're trying to get sponsored up there. Uh, and send some of our HF guys up there to do one of the ham fests, so to speak. And it's pretty interesting what they do and what you can learn with other people that are up there or just around the world and how they do things. All right, so let's get back on mission here with the EIA transmission line. So we have balance and then we have unbalanced. Coax versus twisted pair, balanced. 180 degrees out of phase, unbalanced, single-ended transmission. That's that center conductor. When we look at the EIA physical characteristics, you guys are dealing with D connectors when you're connecting the HST 3000 up to the back of the case on those connectors. That's a D-shaped connector. Back in my day, for those of you who know, ever had a 9-pin printer? Well, there you go. For those of you that had older computers, which had a D connector for your VGA cables, nowadays it's been upgraded to a display port, an HDMI port, a C, USB-C, I think is what it's called. You know, things like that. They're all coming with new connections and they're faster. We looked at the EIA characteristics, oh my goodness. If anybody ever's heard of negative logic, yeah, that's some of the toughest stuff to troubleshoot and try to get on a different mindset, so to speak. When I was working in the air traffic control environment, Working on the OJ314, all of the OJ314 console was nothing but negative logic. And what you thought was a high, it was supposed to be a low, and a low is supposed to be a high. So it was crazy. All of it worked off of either zero or negative five or negative 12. That's negative logic. When we look at the EIA 530, that's what you saw in the back of the NSM. Uh, Case, case A, I think. This was because we needed to upgrade. When you have something so slow with the EIA 5232 uh, Charlie, you need to improve upon it. Now, there's probably more technology that's out there, like I discussed the 613 on the HISI port. You're going to see increases in technology. Again, this is because of the older standard and the slowness of what it did. Ah, yes. You guys were playing with this yesterday. Data terminal equipment. I'm reading this off to you. A device that is the source and destination of the data. Computer. It can also be a mouse or a keyboard. The idea behind data terminal equipment is it's the start or it's the end. So the whole idea behind this is so you can send the signal out and you can actually receive the signal. So if I general general, if I move the mouse, what I'm doing is the mouse here on my mouse pad is moving the mouse on my screen. Okay? The source would be the mouse itself that I'm moving. The destination would be on the screen. I like to use the terminal aspect in saying the computer. I mean, that's just me. That's one way to look at it. The computer starts it. The distant end computer ends it. With DCE communication gear, so to speak, 
that's the one that my computer when I send out all those ones and zeros goes to the modem up in my attic my modem then converts all those ones and zeros over to an analog signal yes it does that and it sends it to the dissonant the communication device between the modem could be the modem the servers and everything else in between that they're all communication devices that's what it says communications establishes maintains and ends a data transfer establishes meaning I'm sending it to the distant end ends a data transfer that's when the distant end takes it demultiplexes it and then hands it off to the computer you can see what that does a modem is, is what they are describing there are four different types of transmission media we got twisted pair cable coax cable fiber optic cable wireless just go through each one everything's pretty much self-explanatory twisted pair you know balanced line transmission coax is the unbalanced line transmission your fiber optic uses light did you guys know that light is RF somewhat the small portion of it right it's in the terahertz but you have wavelengths and that's how we were able to get things to go faster by discovering that if we put information on the light it goes faster because of the wavelength wireless that's your Wi-Fi but we also include anything that's called line of sight you know your tropo uh, satellite all this is becoming increasingly popular because back in the day you had a phone on a wall you had a cord that went to the handset now what do you have no phone. Phone or no phone at all yeah M most people have gone to cell phones as their home phone and it kind of makes sense but you're still attached to a wire when you charge it next up we have something called a digital service unit and let me try to explain the digital service unit as well as the next one which is the channel service unit these are devices that the internet companies use to do troubleshooting that's the best way I can explain it what they do is it is a halfway point between you and the customer or the like AT&T or Verizon or any of those that are managing it so they got to figure out how, where to send their technician it doesn't make any sense to send them the technician out to your place even though your internet is down and then have to do a full-scale investigation so what they do is they use this the DSU and the CSU to determine where they send the technician well the DSU what it does is it looks at everything from your router modem all internal to the house it sends a loop back to see if it is working fine it sends something called oh look at that alternate mark inversion remember I told you about RZ bipolar and RZ bipolar zero suppression well, both of those are considered alternate mark inversion. Get it? Alternate mark, bipolar, it's the same thing. Now, with this one, it only uses RZ bipolar, which is not, not self-clocking. User side of the network. In other words, it's looking at us. Like, for example, if I called out and said, my internet is not working they would say hang on let me uh, double check something what they're doing is they're using that DSU to check your side first because it doesn't make any sense to send the technician out and look at my side when it's actually their side well how do they know if it's their side well the channel service unit this one does network loopbacks so once they determine that it's not your side, they're going to check their side and send the technician on their side. Now this one uses RZ bipolar with zero suppression. Ah, self clocking. And if you decide that you want to look at that 
and you come across Wikipedia, you're probably going to get confused because it wants to go from left to right instead of right to left. So please try to find a credible electronic site when you finally decide that you want to go look this up. And you're going to get shocked, so to speak. So we would just want to keep it simple because you guys just need to know the basics. This is RZ bipolar with zero suppression. When they say police one's density, it is a little bit crazier than you think when you start seeing all that information come at you. I know I was shocked when I seen it too, and then it made sense once I started reading up on it. I don't want to confuse you. RZ bipolar zero suppressing self clocking network side CSU. Now let me go back to this one. I do want to caution you. When you see the CSU, it does not mean customer service unit. It's very easy to get it confused with the DSU, DSU thinking, oh, it's a network site. No, no, it's opposite. Channel service unit. Channels being the servers. All right? so try not to get those confused. Next up, we've got hierarchy. Now, the reason why we look at hierarchy is because we want to build the speed and the bandwidth bigger. So if you take a look at this, it on this particular chart says DS0. This is a 64K for one channel. 64K is voice. That's how they relate to it. VoIP would be another way of saying it. DS1, TS1, we talked about that earlier yesterday about the T1 being a bipolar with eight zeros, with zero suppression. There you go. It's a T1 line that they're looking at. Now, with the T1 line, then look at a standard multiplexer. This is where we get the standard of how many channels a multiplexer is. It's 24. When we start wanting to increase the data rate and the bandwidth, we start looking at putting all of these, how many different types of T1s into a T2 to get us at 6.312 megabits per second. And at that point, looks like it is 4 T1s going into another multiplexer to get the T2. And then in order to get a T3, you got to put a whole bunch of T2s together into a multiplexer to get the T3 out. Now, again, if you look at this bottom statement, insufficient bandwidth at one level requires a network to increase another level. Think of it as another pyramid. The T1s are the base, T2s are the middle, T3s are, you know, getting closer to the top. Because when you look at it this way, I tried to clean this up, but it just goes to show you, you got the T1 multiplexer has 24 channels going in it. In order to make a T2 multiplexer, you need to get four of them together and put them into another multiplexer. In order to get a T3, you got to get a whole bunch of T2s together that have a whole bunch of T1s being put in there. So you can see how everything builds upon each other and sends it right up the path. Now. When you look at the T4 and going to the T5, that's where problems have happened. I haven't read too much on the newer technology, but when you get to the T4 multiplexers, they start developing something called superscripts, which are error problems. I'm pretty sure they've corrected it, but I haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe that they have. And again, this is uh, a build on what servers do. This just gives you an idea on the hierarchy to get there. So we've gone over bandwidth allocations, network infrastructure, transmission media, carrier system concepts, and hierarchy. So how many, what are the four bandwidth allocations? Chairman Short, do you know? Sorry, 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 cut out. What was the question again? Sure. What are the four bandwidth allocations that we just discussed? 
Yes, sir. There are conventional, demand assigned, dynamic, and time of day restriction. Outstanding. Let's ask Sergeant McKinney. Do you know what uh, a balanced line is? Tell me everything you know about it right now. I am struggling drawing blank. Okay. Sergeant Paul, any idea? This is the one. It's a single line. Uh, it's coax and it goes both ways. Uh, that would be unbalanced. Oops. Okay, so balance has two lines, and they're 180 degrees uh, offset, or what's the word, out of phase from each other. Mm-hmm. That's the basic concept, yep. Okay, so that's balance. Yeah, balance line is a twisted okay. pair. One of them is 180 degrees out of the other one. Uh, and, and like you said, with the balance, that's the single entity line there. Shields on the outside, that's data back and forth. All right, so at this point, we are going to take a quick 10-minute break, come back, and finish up with one Delta and two Alpha, as well as going over the tech manual and give you an idea of the highlights that get you familiar with the tech manual with the NSM. All right, so break. Okay, you wanted the hierarchy? Let me go back to the hierarchy. Okay. All right, so looking at this, my initial like, knee-jerk reaction is to look at that. So where it says Delta Sierra Zero. Correct. And that line left to right, and then it's got 64 uh, kilobits. Or yeah. Yeah. From that line then down to the second line, DS1 slash T1, my initial thought is like, okay, you're adding one single multiplexer, but that's not necessarily the case. Then looking at the, the slide after this one, is that it's kind of like you're feeding a multiplexer into another multiplexer with each line you go down on this slide? Yes. So, okay. so, yeah. so you, in, that, in that diagram after this slide, you've got a total of four, well, technically five multiplexers, I guess. Yeah. With each okay. multiplexer, you're putting outputs of another multiplexer in it. Okay. So that's how you get that exponential growth, kind of? Yes. And the main takeaway from this is it's the building block of how... Uh, I don't know what else is. It's really considered the that. hierarchy and how to get a bigger bandwidth and speed. Okay. What's the cost then, like, when you start chaining this stuff together and getting these big, big numbers? It must be a drawback of some sort. <laughs> it probably is. I haven't really checked the numbers, but uh, I'm sure. I mean, just going to pick a number out of, si out of the, the sky here. My guess is if you got a T1 multiplexer, it's probably a thousand dollars. Let's just say. Okay. okay. So now you're going to put four of those into another one. So you got the four at a thousand dollars. That's four thousand dollars. Putting it into another one, which is another thousand dollars. Okay. So all of a sudden you got five thousand dollars just to get a T2 line out. And then the T2. Do these stand for tier? Like you could say tier. Bad. Yes. I I don't know what the T stands for. The DS. Uh, I remember seeing what that was a while back, but, you know, when I taught the FCC 100, I was pretty much up on some of the jargon there, but it's been such a long time uh, in trying to remember all of that stuff. Gross. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I was just wanted to... Sure. thought I was kind of off kilter, but I think I get it now. Okay. So. No, it's not a problem. That's what I'm here for. Get a sip of water and I'll let you take your break too. Thank Roger you. Roger that. All right. You can provide 23 lines with voice. The 24th line is meant to be the communication back and forth between another uh, line that is telling it, hey, I need these particular lines. Now it gets into a whole new can of worms, but I did find out what DSO means, or DS0. It's the digital signaling rate for one channel at 64K. 
That is mainly for a voice. It's a digital signal ray, R-A-Y? Uh, a di digital signal rate. Rate, okay. Now, Got it. Let me go back one and verify. Uh, DS signal zero. Uh, basic signaling, uh, basic digital signaling rate of 64 kilobits per second. Uh, corresponding to the capacity of one analog frequency equivalent communication channel, the DSO rate, which is equivalent to EO, which is the European carrier system. TO is the North American. So if you see the zero or the E zero, that's the European, and T zero is the American, North American. Okay. So it gets crazy, and what's even more amazing is if you get into how the European servers work versus the American or the North American servers, we work on a basis of a low ping rate. In other words, that's the server pinging each other. If something is wrong, it gets faster so you'll see more of the numbers. With the European, it reverses it. If you see a high ping rate, that means everything's working. <laughs> if you see a lower one, it means it's not working very well. So it's funny because yeah, you see a low ping rate, your your game is running smooth, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So, I mean, it's just American standards, here, European standards. Yeah. It just depends on where you're at and what you got, what you're trying to do there. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, get this on the road. Identify basic facts and principles, capabilities, limitations of multiplexing equipment. As always, seventy percent on the block test is what you need. Hour and a half test. Got to answer twenty-eight correctly out of those forty. Yep. You were working on the NSM50. That's what we're going over. Now, I'm going to quickly go through this because I want to get into the tech order after we cover 2 alpha. So this should be pretty quick. We're going to look at the Vertex Nodal Satellite Multiplexer. Now, Vertex is the company that makes it. Purpose of the NSM, functional description, operational characteristics, and the NSM configuration. So I'm going to breeze through this real quick because the more better information is actually in the tech order. So when we look at the purpose, well, we multiplex and demultiplex. Everybody knows about this. Now, the bottom line here that you read, the maximum aggregate data rate is 52 megabits per second. Okay, that is done on the HISI port, and we'll, I'll show you that. When we look at the NSM and the two operational modes, they have legacy and enhanced. Does anybody know what legacy means? Old. Yep, old and enhanced means new. Again, you did this on the NSM configuration cut sheet. You probably didn't notice it because it was already selected for you. Just saying, it was in there. We have input ports. You got 12 NRZ ports at 8.448 megabits per second. You got 6 T1E1. Hey, there you go. North American versus European at 2.048 megabits per second. You got 6 CDI ports at 4608 meg and the two high speed serial interface ports at 52 meg. All of them do have caveats to it. This is the back of the case. This is where the NSM plugs into. We'll see that in a minute, and you'll be going, what do you mean it plugs into it? Yeah, the back of the case is not the NSM. The ports are part of the NSM. So again, this shows you the area that you guys are working in. The red is where you were working with the NRZ ports. There were 12 of them. At the top was the CDI. Off to the left, you had the HISI and the T1E1. And right above those things with the energy in that, you had EIA 530 on it too. And of course, we're going to go to this tech manual here in just a few minutes after we cover the HST 3000. Again, this is all being pulled from the TSC 179. 
We'll get to everything here in just a moment. I just wanted to go through that and breeze through it so we can get to, to Alpha, identify basic facts about the capabilities and limitations of the BERTS bit error rate test set. Again, 70% on the test. That's what you need. Now, you guys have already played with the BERTS, better known as the HST3000. Now, with this BERTS, the HST are the same. Don't get them confused. Now, the basic BERTS, the overall idea behind the BERTS means that you're performing tests, loopbacks, and trying to find out if the signal is good or not. Now, what does it mean by signal? It means that you have a very low bit error rate. Lower the better. Closer to zero is actually the best, but we all know out there in the real world that we're not going to get zero. Even though you guys, when you did the loop back, you got zero for errors. Or you should have. Again, this is done alone or alongside mission traffic. Now, let's look at the HST3000, which is what the actual BERTs that you guys were using. You can purchase this off of eBay for about three grand. When it was brand new, you're looking at about five grand. Now, as you well know, technology increases every year if not every six months if not every three months and so forth and so on there's newer models but right now the hst 3000 does what we need it to do so we'll keep using it it is a tough little piece of equipment it's rugged handheld and battery operated it does end-to-end -end testing and bit error rate testing now question two on your homework under 2 alpha let me tell you what you should be reading the HST 3000 it says what does the BERTS do or the HST 3000 do well it should say what should be the three test modes are or what are the three test modes of the HST 3000 that's what the question should be asking so if you just happen to put that in, this part in, okay, we understand. But what we should be asking is what are the three test modes of the HST 3000s? Which are, hmm, we just went over DTE emulation. So what is DTE emulation or DTE? Anybody? Data trans. Not that data, data terminal, terminal equipment. equipment. Okay, data terminal equipment. So what is it emulating? A uh, computer. Computer. Yeah. 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 Computer. Source and destination. What is DCE? Data communications yeah. equipment. What is it? Modem. Modem. The communications between the two. So we've already gone over that instrument. There you go. The BERTS is performing it. Then we have monitor. Now, monitor meaning, hey, I'm looking, I'm outside looking in as to what's happening out there so those are the three test modes that the HST 3000 has there is a yeah, I want to say about a 20 page manual that comes with it we don't give it to you because this is you know the information that you see right here is all you really need to know in the study guy workbook so we've gone over the general description of the BERTs and describing what the HST 3000 does so what I want to do now which I should have brought this up earlier, is go to the NSM extract. This is the nodal satellite modem or multiplexer 50. So if you will pull this up, I will go through it with you to give you an idea what to look for. If you're having problems looking for it, it is in your, uh, let's say, your files somewhere where it says 31 Romeo 2 2 Tango Sierra Charlie 179 2 Extract NSM 50 Operators Manual. I'll give you a minute to let you pull it up. The 
It's the NSM 50 mic operator's manual, correct, sir? Yes, sir. Should we intro it? It should be I'll intro. I'll throw the uh, Google Drive link into the house pane. Go ahead, sir. Good deal. Click that link and then just click block seven in the materials and you'll find it. You got it there, Brown? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Anybody not have this pulled up yet? All right. <clears throat> I don't. Okay. I'll hold on then. Are you on your phone? Is it going to be difficult to do or what? Just, Just got it pulled up. Okay. Okay. All right, the first thing I wanted to show you is down at the bottom right on the front page, it says Vertex RSI. That is the company. When you see Vertex NSM50, that's what they're referencing is the company. So please don't get the NSM50 as to, well, wait a minute, it says the Vertex. No, that's the company that makes it. So when we pull this down, I am getting into chapter 1, 1 1.1, should be PDF file page 13, and it just describes what the nodal satellite multiplexer is, just a general idea of what it is, just that first paragraph there. General information, okay, that's chapter 1, and then we get into 1.3 general function description now even though the slide just gave you a generality this provides you with a lot of details on there the last sentence NSM operational status is also indicated to the operator by the 10 LEDs on the front panel Okay, did you see any LEDs on the back of it, on the case? No, sir. I didn't see any on the front either. Okay, really? I wasn't looking for them. No, sir. Okay, there. well, when you were... Go ahead. Yeah, it was like that red air light. Yeah, when you had problems, that red air light came on, as well as all your alarms and that would indicate you had an alarm on it, too. Air light said that you weren't synced up, so something happened either between the program that you just did or something happened with the HST 3000s that you didn't program it in correctly. Or, wait a minute, that sounded wrong. You programmed the data rate wrong. How about that? Yeah, we did that on our PC. <laughs> <laughs> but you get my point is those indicator lights, if they're not all green, you and I, I'll take that back. I think there's four or five that come on green. As long as the error light doesn't illuminate, you're golden. Then you should be able to look at your computer and go, my alarms, they're all green. That's a good thing. Now we come down to 1.3.1.4 control computer interface. I'm pointing out some facts here. Signals between the NSM and the control computer are standard RS-232. You've seen this elsewhere. And 422 DTE signals. So what's it acting like? A computer? Exactly. The terminal. So you can see how what we have gone over now applies in the NSM tech manual. Ooh. 
Now we get into the ports. We got 1.3.1.5, PDF file 17. I got a bunch of stuff in here highlighted. It's called External Signal Interface Descriptions. I'm going to Bravo. Let you catch up here. Bravo says NRZ group port data clock signals must be balanced. What is balance? 2K, uh, two wires, two twisted pairs. And? Help. Anybody? 180. Yeah, one of them is 180 degrees out of phase of the other. Copy. Yeah, so you can see all of what we've gone over is being applied here. We, we see signal rates in our Z. There's our signal format. Wow. We have legacy and enhance, old versus new. Now, here's the question. What is the max data rate for the NRZ group port? Let's see if Airman Short can answer that question. Max data rate for the NRZ port. Max data rate, one second. Sure. Data rate or max port rate? You can go with either or. Oh, okay, um, that will be 8.448 mega, megabits per second. And where did you find that? Yeah, I actually found it on the study guide. Okay, I'm in the TO. In the TO, yeah. yes, sir. That's the reason why I asked, where did you find that? Yes, sir. It clued me in when you said megabits per second. I knew that you were looking at the study guy workbook. I want you to find it in the tech order here or tech manual. This is a practice for you guys that if you happen to see a test question, you need to come here to verify your answer. Just because you pull it out of the study guy workbook, you're trying to memorize it. Why? It's right there. Can you repeat that question again? Sure can. I said, what is the maximum data rate for the NRZ group port? Pingle, any idea? Um, what I'm seeing is from 8 kilobits per, uh, up to, or per second up to and including 8 for for eight kilobytes or kilobits per second and eight kilobit per second increments. Okay, and you found that in. That's on uh, underneath B, um, or in one point three point one point five. Which number in B? That is two. So that's an enhanced mode. Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So let let's. Let's look through this in the simple. Oh, I see it now. It was right in my face. Yeah. Let's look at this from the simple point of view. First of all, I asked, well, what is the max data rate for the NRZ port? Well, the first place you went to was the NRZ port, which is what we were on. You know that legacy is the older equipment, so more than likely, you're not going to have anything that's going to exceed what the enhanced is. And enhanced is a newer one. What it means from the 8 kilobits per second up to and including 8448 kilobits per second means it can start as low, if you program it, as 8, all the way up to 8448K. Now, what does it mean by 8 kilobits per second increments? That's because it's sending it in packets, data packets. So that, that's what it's talking about when it says 8K. That is correct, 8448 kilobits per second. I'm not trying to get into a whole lot of details. So now with that in mind, let's go to Charlie. It is a T1E1 
group ports must be bipolar. Oh, wow, that's a key. Hmm. Number one says T1 AMI, alternate mark inversion. Eight, Bravo 8, Zulu Sierra. That's bipolar with the bit violation being thrown at the eighth zero. Zero suppression. That's self clocking, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And it says at a frequency of 1.544 uh, kilobits per second, or one, excuse me, not 1.544 kilobits, that's 1.544 megabits per second, or 1544 kilobits per second. That is North American, like I was explaining to you earlier yesterday. Number two, E1. E1 is from the European Union also can be used as standard in the Japanese area. AMI, alternate mark inversion, again, it's bipolar. Hotel Delta Bravo 3, that's the way it describes it in the European. It throws the bit violation at the fourth zero, but it's looking at three zeros in a row anytime it sees it, and it sees a fourth one, it's going to throw the bit violation there. So that's the difference between a North American versus a European one. This one does 2.048 megabits per second or 2048 kilobits per second. Let's look at Delta group modem. Anytime you see group modem, 99.9% .9 of the time it's referenced in CDI, conditioned die phase. You have a legacy and an in, in enhanced mode. So when you look at this, if you had a question what is the max data rate in legacy? Your answer should be, let's ask Sergeant McKinney. Question is, in legacy mode in group modem or CDI, what is the max data rate? Uh, 152 kbps. 152? Or uh, 1,152. Okay, good. So... See how the question is worded. In enhanced mode, it's 4608. So what's the max data rate for the group modem? Anybody? 4608. Yeah, 4608. Okay. Let's go down to E. This is your HISI, High Speed Serial Interface. Notice it has a legacy mode. It has an enhanced mode with the 530. Ooh, yeah, I remember that one. And then the enhanced mode with the EIA 613, so it's a newer cable. You'll notice that the newer cable goes all the way up to 52,000 kilobits per second or 52 meg. Now, in F, secure order wire data signals must be unbalanced NRZ. Wow. So what does that tell you, unbalanced NRZ? See if uh, eBay can uh, determine what that means. Uses coax cable. Okay, and mm -hmm. what does the NRZ do for us? You know, that's not self clocking. It's a hint. <laughs> Sad and blind. I don't know. Yeah, well, you're right. That's what I was looking for. It's not self-clocking, so you have to send a clock cycle with it. So you see how we were looking at signal formats and combining with, with our balance and unbalanced lines. So all this is coming to fruition just in this tech manual. So let me go to the next one. Purpose of equipment. Now, remember on that slide, there was very little on it. Now, you can see that it says that NSM, and this is 2.2. .2. So, so far, we've looked at Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. 2.2 2 .2 says purpose of equipment, that whole paragraph. Now, I like to show you this particular picture because it, it is well worth what you are seeing. So, you have all these users coming into the multiplexer and then sending it over to the satellite to be modulated and be sent up to the bird and then relayed to another satellite on the ground 
you know, thousands of miles away, goes back into the NSM, gets demodulated, de demuxed, and then sent out to the users. That's a pretty good picture on what the NSM does. If you space the satellite dish and the NSM and put the iDirect in there, that would be another big picture, wouldn't it? So the NSM would go to the iDirect, the iDirect would go to the sat dish, and the dish would send it up to the bird, and then the bird would relay it, and then reverse what we need, we just done. Functional description, I show you in 2.3 that anytime you see the word MUX, it means multiplex, and if you see DMUX, it means demultiplex. Again, picture's worth a thousand words. If you just wanted to know how many ports that the NSM has, you can see the highlighted area. You got 12 NRZ, 2 HISI, 6 T1E1s, or 6 CDI. I hope I didn't miss it. No, I don't think I did. Network configurations. When we went over the types of network synchronization, this gives you an idea of what you might be able to see out there. Hmm. I like it because it's a general principles of the network itself. Modes of information. Ah, good. 2.3.3 user port interfaces. This is on page 22 of the PDF. The last sentence. Very important. There are 26 ports available on the rear panel. That's the case. You have 12 NRZ, 6 T1E1, 6 group modems, and 2 hissies. Then you have the comma. It says any 12. Any 12 of these ports can be active in the multiplex or demultiplex configuration at one time. So you can use two hissies. You can use six uh, CDIs. You can use one T1. You can use one NRZ. That gives you 12. Amazing, huh? I hope I did that right and comes up with 12. Okay. Now for the next part on the 2.3.3.1, it's just telling you how many ports there are and just gives you an overview of what these things are doing. So you can see the NRZ is 12, the T1, E1 ports are 6. You got 6 CDIs and you got 2 HISI ports. And that pretty much concludes everything that's in there. Now, Sergeant Paul, you were trying to figure out what the multiplexers are doing. This gives you an idea that when you normally in a multiplexer, you have approximately two, if not three different time generation clocks. In other words, something's in there that's providing a frequency reference using phase lock loop to keep everybody in time. Normally, the first one is when the users are coming in, you're using that time to build that aggregate and then you have a timing sequence that you're using to send out to the distant end. So you can see just in this picture, the timing source is how it's going to select these 12 going through a big switch. And hopefully that video I sent you, you've got the idea of the ones and the zeros and how it switches between each channel and getting the ones and zeros over and going to the next channel, getting those ones and zeros over and building that aggregate. Which video was that, sir? Uh, it's, oh, geez, I'd have to go back and look at your your item there. So I apologize, I don't have a, yeah. It, it's, watch the first part, you should get an idea, and, you sh and I'll, I'm gonna look for some more. I, I thought I had found one that was even clearer, more clear than that one, so I'll try to find it for you.
No worries. Was this on the YouTube channel, though? Because I don't think you had sent me a video direct or anything like that. No, maybe I'd send it to somebody else. <laughs> oh, they'll be happy. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I kind of went for a real low to the ground explanation. The multiplexers mm -hmm. on, on YouTube seems worth a, worth a hoot. And um, I'll kind of keep going with the YouTube channel, too. Here. Okay. And if you see something good, please shoot it my way. Yeah, if you see something that... You know, you actually understand? Send it my way because I'll put it up. Or, okay. or you can put okay. it on the uh, chat for everybody. I'll do that. All right. So I do have one on 2.3.6 order wire. Let me try to give an explanation this. You have these 12 ports that you can use, any mix of those 12 ports. That is an aggregate. Ones and zeros being built, being sent out. There's this thing called order wire that sits alongside of it. It's not in the mission traffic. It's actually our channel, the maintenance channel. It's separate from it, but it goes out with it. The reason why we have it is so that if our mission traffic goes down, we have a way to communicate to the distant end to troubleshoot. Without the order wire, everything's down. And I think we got one more to do. Here it is. This is the rear of the NSM-50. Doesn't look anything like what's on the back of the case. And I point you to Juliet 2 and Juliet 3, which are the NRZ ports in this description on the table there. Okay, connector Juliet 2 says NRZ ports 1 through 6. In other words, there's one cable that fits on the back of that NSM. On the case, it's going through 1 through 6. There's six separate cables. So you can imagine one cable here and six over here. So it just it breaks it out. So what you see on the back of the case is not what's on the back of the NSM. And then we come to the front panel. Here is the LEDs that I was talking about. Normally, number five is your error light. And that is an indication that you've got some issues. And, of course, it goes through these ten LEDs all together. All these are right in the middle of it and gives you an indication of what's happening. I think that isn't it. it. Other than on your computer, it's showing you on the GUI what to click and the tab that will come up that you got to select. Any questions? No, I've gone over a lot. Any questions? Crazy? No, I just got to go through the homework and probably rewatch a video or two because that was a lot, like you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is what is expected of you for tomorrow morning. We'll still do the 9 o'clock unless you want to change it. Any changes? You like this time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, more than uh, 1230 for sure. Well, I was at a... Uh, now, normally I do SIA between 10 and 11, gives you time for lunch, and then at 12.30 gives you guys enough time that if you had to do something like out processing or something like that, I give you enough time for that to get back, get in at 12.30. So 9 o'clock works for me fine too, so I don't have a problem with it. Just remember, tomorrow we can do SIA in the afternoon. So if you are having problems... Tomorrow morning, when we go through all this, please let me know. We'll do SIA for about an hour. Go over the information that you're having problems with. Maybe do a quick review. And hopefully that will help you out. Tomorrow's Friday, correct? Correct, yes, sir. I haven't lost days yet. So, tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. We'll see you then. Hey, so you were saying um, what was required for us tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Just keep Thank you. catch up with the homework that we've covered today. So <laughs> yeah. through so, Alpha. 
Yeah, through 2 Alpha, so that means we're going to go over tomorrow morning. We're going to go over homework from 2 Bravo, you know, and complete that all the way through 2 Alpha. Once we get done with class, I will expect homework to be sent to me so I can verify that you're doing it. Let's just say uh, by 1 o'clock, everybody should hand it in. That's 1 Alpha through 2 Alpha, and we'll go from there. Can you tell us what units you plan on lecturing tomorrow so I can watch those videos ahead of time? Sure can. Three alpha normally. Three alpha through four alpha. And I'm pretty sure those videos do show each one of them. As far as other instructors, I'm not too sure where they go from there. But most of us do the one alpha, one bravo on day one, uh, one Charlie through two alpha on day two. And then three alpha. Some go all the way up to four bravo. I don't know. So it just gives you an idea of where I like to stop. Because I don't like to overload. But at the same time, I use SIA as my backup for everybody. So when are we, when, when are we trying to homework in again? Okay. Tomorrow afternoon by 1 o'clock. Once we go over it, you can yes, go ahead and correct it and then send it in to me as soon as you correct it. No later than 1 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, I got two people talking here. Uh, Aaron Brown, you want to go first? Brown? Are you there? Yes, sir. So you don't want one alpha today? No, sir. Uh, what you do with okay. one alpha, if you made a mistake on one of them, go ahead and correct it. Tomorrow, when we go over it, you make a mistake on one of them, correct it, and then send it in to me. And this is after we go over the homework. The idea here is, yes, sir. you know, when we go over homework, if you make a mistake, that's your chance for you to, hey, I really didn't understand that. Can we go over it again? You know, that's an indication that, Hey, you might need a little extra help on that. But if you understand it right away, then, yeah, go ahead, correct it, and then send it to me. And then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. All right. See you guys at 9 o'clock tomorrow? Yes, sir. All right. We, yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Have a good day. You too.